previously on Pod for Israel. If you were to ask a religious Jewish person, do you keep the Torah? He would say, well, of course I do. I keep the commandments or I do my best. Stephen, do you keep the Torah? Well, of course I do. I believe in Jesus. So if you look at Stephen's sermon, he's going to basically, like I said, he mentions Moses nine times. Mm. That's quite strategic He's been because of the accusation that he's rejected Moses. He, in fact, Moses becomes the key character in his sermon. But S- Stephen's sermon shows basically two things. Number one, that he truly believes in Moses and the prophets. Number two, the religious leaders truly do not believe in Moses and the prophets. Again, he turns the table on them, which is quite significant. Now, I can't go through the entire sermon, but if I were to divide up the sermon, it's a very narrative approach to Mm -hmm. the Torah. So he he looks at three key characters in the Torah, Abraham in verses two through eight, Joseph verses nine through 16, and then Moses verses 19 through 15. Then he, he concludes, and we'll talk about that as well because he takes some key phrases from the Torah as a way to kind of to, 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 to kind of conclude his incriminating evidence against our, our leaders. All right. Okay, so why does our faith in Yeshua fulfill the law? And firstly, because we believe in the prophet whom Moses promised. Hmm. So again, we're gonna look at verses two through 40, but really I'm gonna, I wanna concentrate particularly on Joseph and Moses in, in Stephen's sermon, because they're very, very important. So Moses promised, and it's a key, a key promise. In Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Now, as sort of a a side note, Rashi does something very interesting with this verse. Um, A lot of Rashi's commentary is, is there to refute the messianic interpretations or uh, to, to refute the Christian interpretations of, of, of the Hebrew Bible. And Rashi knows right. that this verse was a key verse for believers. And they argued that God would raise up a prophet like Moses. And so what does he do? He looks at the Hebrew text and he says, no, the point is not that God's going to raise up a special prophet among you like Moses, but that God's going to raise up prophets from your brothers like Moses. In other words, in other words, all one of those little things. No, no, what he's doing is he's saying that all true prophets have to be Jewish. They have to be like Moses, as in from among your brothers. And so what he does is he says every true prophet from the people of Israel is like Moses. That's how he refutes uh the interpretation, but that would work, but for the fact of Deuteronomy 34. Deuteronomy 34 is the final chapter of the Torah. Now, it may shock the listeners, it may shock the viewers to realize Moses didn't write Deuteronomy 34. It says that Deuteronomy 34, in in Deuteronomy 34, Moses was long dead, and nobody knew where he was buried till this very day. And Deuteronomy 34 is a, the final chapter in the canonical Torah. Right. And there's the voice of some unknown prophet who's basically summarizing the greatness of Moses. But what does he do? He cites the promise that Moses makes in Deuteronomy 18.15. Listen to what he says. Yeah. Never since then has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Now, if you looked at the Hebrew of this verse, he's clearly so citing Deuteronomy 18.15. In other words, he's saying, hey guys, do you remember the prophet that God promised, that, yeah. would God, that Moses promised that God would raise up a prophet like him? Well, the final verses of the Torah says that prophet never arose like Moses. In other words, the final verses of the Torah 
understand Deuteronomy 18.15, not as every prophet, but as an exclusive prophet like Moses Very much. Yeah. who had never come. Yeah. So it leaves open the fact that if Moses is a true prophet, then the words of his prophecy still need to come true. Right. And that's exactly how Stephen takes this verse, as a promise of an exclusive yeah. prophet like Moses. So, if we look at the whole principle of the deeds of the fathers are a, uh, the deeds of the fathers are a sign for the sons. Mm -hmm. In Stephen's sermon, the deeds of the fathers are a sign of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. In his sermon, there are two key figures: Joseph and Moses. And I want you to notice something brilliant. He shows the parallels between Joseph and Moses. For instance, Joseph and Moses are both those whom God has called to redeem his people who are at first rejected. Mm. At first rejected. So in Acts 7 verse 9, and the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph. In Acts 7 27, but the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside. Moses, he rejected Moses, he said, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Here's Stephen's point. Hey guys, you wanna be Israel's redeemer? Here's, here's the job description. In order to be Israel's savior, you have to first be rejected by your own people. Guess what? Joseph was rejected even though God called him. Moses was rejected even though God called him. Right. Proof positive, my dear friends, Moses, yeah. or sorry, Jesus is Israel's savior. Right. Even though they rejected Joseph, Joseph, even though rejected Moses, God's presence was still with the Redeemer. Yeah. Notice what it says in Acts 7, 9 through 10. But God was with him and rescued him out of all of his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him who made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household about yeah. Moses. Verse 20, and this time Moses was born and he was beautiful in God's hmm. sight. So these rejected God chosen redeemers are the ones who bring salvation to their people. Yeah. Acts 7, 12 through 13. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers on their first visit. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers. Listen, yeah. Steve, Stephen's, well, Stephen's yeah. reference to first and second are quite strategic here because what Stephen is saying is just like Joseph was rejected the first time, but he will be recognized the second time, yeah. so too Jesus. Amen. Notice what he says now about Moses in 735. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer. And as he's saying it, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a scathing accusation yeah. against the religious leaders of his day who were also rejecting God's appointed leader, yeah. Jesus. Yeah. The punchline of the sermon. Here's the punchline, okay? A couple of verses. I wanna read Acts 7, 24 through 29. And seeing one of them being wrong, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. That is Moses. Here's what Moses supposed. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand Mm -hmm. Again, think about what Stephen is saying. Mm -hmm. I suppose that you would understand that Jesus is the chosen redeemer, wow. but you do not understand. And then he goes on to say, and on the following day he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them saying, men, you are brothers, why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside saying, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Well, I can tell you who he did, who did? God. Yeah. Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, 
where he became the father of two sons. Let me keep going, verses 35 through 40. Yeah. I want you to notice again how often Stephen now is going to refer to Moses. And every time he refers to Moses, just replace Moses with Jesus because that's what he's doing. Yeah. Just take the word Moses, put Jesus, because it fits here. This Moses, this Jesus, whom they rejected saying, hmm. who made you a ruler and a judge? This man, God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out performing wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses, this is the Jesus wow. who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet <laughs> like me from among your brothers. How is Jesus most like Moses? How is Jesus most like Joseph? He was chosen by God yet rejected by his people. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai. And with our fathers, he received living oracles to give to us. Jesus received living oracles to give to us. Our fathers refused to obey him, but thrust him aside. And in their hearts, they turned to Egypt, saying to Aaron, make for us gods who will go before us. And for, as for this Jesus, as for this Moses, who led us out from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become hmm. of him. It's, it's remarkable. Yeah. This sermon is brilliant. But you know what else I also noticed? So for the past two years, I've been doing research on the ways in which the major figures in Genesis prefigure Moses. Hmm. And what's really interesting is that Stephen points to parallels between Joseph and Moses as key to his sermon. But guess what? Did you know that within the Torah, Moses already presents Joseph as a precursor, as a prefiguration of himself. I counted 10 parallels, 10 parallels in Genesis between Joseph and Moses. Yeah. I'll read them. Both begin their careers as shepherds, literal shepherds that become metaphorical shepherds of God's people. Mm. Both are beautiful. Both are separated from their families at a young age. Both are Hebrew slaves in Egypt who become leaders of Israel. Mm. Both escape plots of murder against them. Both of them marry daughters of Gentile priests. Mm. Both of them have two sons and they name their two sons names that bring them comfort in their exile. They both leave Egypt to they both leave Egypt together. Moses brings Joseph's bones up out of Egypt. They're both Hebrews hmm. who are confused as Egyptians. Yeah. And finally, and most important, both are rejected by the people whom God called them to save. Stephen's, Stephen's sermon isn't creative, extra Jesus, yeah. but careful, exe Jesus. Stephen is really mm. and truly demonstrating that the intent of the Torah is, in fact, to identify Jesus as the promised Redeemer. Yeah, wow. And just even to think of like, oh, and there's so much depth that, you know, it, I'm sure Stephen is probably even bubbling inside of even more things. Just even as you, we talk about a prophet like, like Moses and what, what Yeshua did, what Jesus, like what Moses did and so forth, like even feeding in the wilderness, you have the, the feeding of the 5,000 and, and what happened right after that? He fed them in the wilderness, but then they came up to him and said, oh, will you give us bread? They just got fed and they wanted, uh, we're always, you know, led by our stomachs, I guess. But they were like, Moses gave us bread in the desert. He just gave you bread in the wilderness. Like he just multiplied the loaves for you. He just fed you. And yet that's the sign that they're looking for. Yet he literally just did that. So that's what's really interesting is that, you know, the way that the Torah presents Moses, if you think about the concluding verses in the Torah, it gives us yeah. a sense of, of how Moses wants to actually understand who he is. He is the greatest of prophets who did all these signs and wonders. And yeah. yet... 
Deuteronomy, it's really interesting. In Deuteronomy 29, it says, but God has not yet given you a heart to understand and mm. eyes to see. Yeah. And so Moses did all these signs and wonders, and yet Israel mm. didn't understand. They rejected yeah. Moses. Yeah. When we start to actually look then at the presentation in the Gospels of Jesus, there are so many similarities between Jesus mm. and Moses. Jesus, one of Moses' first signs to the people is to turn the water into blood. <laughs> What's Jesus' first sign to his people? Turning water into? Wine. Wine. There's a parallel there. Yeah. The feeding of the 5,000 in the wilderness. Yeah. Even walking on the water in some ways is intended to remind us of Moses who passed through the waters. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so... By virtue of the fact that the people that Stephen is talking to have so strongly rejected Jesus and his signs mm -hmm. and his wonders is actually proof that Jesus is who he said he is. Yeah. So why does our faith in Yeshua fulfill the law? Not only because we have believed in the prophet who Moses said would come, but also because we believe in the new covenant, which Moses promised to his people. Right. So we're gonna look at these verses 41 through 43. Stephen is kind of wrapping up his sermon. But I want you to notice, I'll read a few verses again from verses 41 through 53. And they made a calf in those days. Here Moses is, is with them, but they still made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands, just like they mm. were rejoicing in the works of the temple in Stephen's yeah, day. Right, right. But God turned away and gave them over to the worship, to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. And so he goes on to quote the book of the prophets. I want you to, I want to keep on reading. He concludes his sermon by saying, you stiff necked people, mm. uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. Hmm. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered, you who have received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Now, it's important for us to understand, Stephen obviously doesn't hate his people. He's not preaching a hate sermon against no. them because his final words is, Father, forgive them. Yeah, and exactly. just like Joseph was recognized on the second appearance, yeah. I believe that Stephen fully anticipates and understands that one day the veil will be lifted. But I want you to notice that Stephen strategically uses words, condemning phrases against the, the rulers of his people that are taken directly from the Torah. So he says, you stiff-necked people, verse 51. Well, where does that phrase stiff-necked people come from? From the Torah. From the Torah, yeah. Exodus 33, verse three. Yeah. But I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked stiff people. people. He goes on to say, he calls them uncircumcised in heart. Verse yeah. 51, where does that come from? The also Torah. from the Torah, so that I walked in, in Leviticus 26, 41, so that I walked contrary to them and brought them into the land of their enemies, exile. Why? If then their uncircumcised heart is humbled and they make amends for their iniquity. Yeah. The prophets also talk about this uncircumcised heart. Now here's what's really interesting. We tend to think that the, 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 the message of the Torah, or this is, this, I think it's a wrong assumption, is that, that the message of the Torah is laws for the people. Mm. But what's interesting, if anything, the Torah shows us that there's something desperately wrong with our people's hearts and that the laws didn't change us yeah. at all. Yeah. In fact, the Torah ends in Deuteronomy 31, verses 16 through 18, and verses 20 through 21, with assurances yeah. that Israel will break the Sinai covenant. And the Lord said to Moses, Deuteronomy 31, verses 16 and following, Behold, you are about to lie down with your fathers. Then this people will rise and whore after the foreign gods among them in the land that they are entering, and they will forsake me and break my covenant 
that I made with them. He goes on in verses 20 through 21, for when I have brought them into the land flowing with milk and honey, which I swore to give to their fathers and they have eaten and are full and grown fat, they will turn to other gods and serve them and despise me and break my covenant. The message of the Torah is clearly not, hey guys, good luck. Yeah. Keep the Sinai covenant. Yeah, the you message can do it. is <laughs> you guys need a new heart. I mean, yeah. you think about the fact that Israel, throughout the story of, of it, the, the, the narrative of the Torah, they don't miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. As Moses is giving the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, Israel is breaking the Ten Commandments down below. Yeah. Right? They, they, they see the glory, they see the fire burning the mountain, and yet still they're, they're drawn away after. Yeah. Man-made images. The know. tabernacle, as God ordains the tabernacle, yeah. that Moses has just ordained Aaron and his sons to, to run the tabernacle. In Leviticus 8 and 9, yeah. what happens in Leviticus 10? The sons of Aaron offer strange fa- fire. Yeah. In Exodus 19 through Numbers chapter 10, Israel is at the foot of Mount Sinai for an entire year, an entire year receiving the laws. No sooner do they leave, Numbers chapter 11, and what do they start to do? They start to complain. Yeah. They finally get to the, to the borderline of the promised land. Numbers 13, they send the spies out. What do the people do? They reject God's good and pr- the, the promised land, and yeah. they want to go back to Egypt. Yeah. If anything, the Torah's message is, guys, we've got a problem with our hearts. Yeah. We will break the Sinai covenant. We yeah. need a new covenant and we need a better Moses. And this again was echoed through the ages. You, you know, I was, I was even thinking about like, you know, Ezra and Nehemiah led these amazing reforms. And you could say before then, maybe they didn't know the scriptures as well. Maybe it wasn't taught as well. And it seemed that Ezra was in, in an amazing way leading these reforms to get more literacy and so forth. The, some people think the Parsha, like the Parsha, the, the Torah portions came from that time. But but yet you look through the ages and before Yeshua, you saw major problems. Yeah, there was pockets of people that were resisting, you know, idolatry and stuff like that. But there were still like huge groups uh, going with the Hellenization and going with all this stuff. You know, it, the problem was still there. And even as you read Nehemiah, it ends on a low note. And that's right after this reform and this amazing kind of, not just the reformation, but this like revival of heart that happened. Uh, but yet it ends on a low note saying, uh, it's not fixed yet, guys. It's not fixed by just reading harder, trying harder to do the commandments. They're still broken. So what's interesting is about, if you look at Ezra and Nehemiah, in fact, I think the point of Ezra and Nehemiah, the ending of Nehemiah, is that all of Ezra and Nehemiah's reforms are singularly undone. Yeah. And so what's the point there? And I think the point we also find at the end of the Torah, what is the biblical cure? What is the mosaic cure for stiff necks and uncircumcised hearts? Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. We tend to think of Moses as the preacher of the Sinai covenant, but Moses was not the preacher of the Sinai covenant. Moses was the preacher of the new covenant. Mm -hmm. The whole of the Torah is the justification Mm -hmm. for the fact that we as a people need a circumcised heart. We need a new heart. Jeremiah echoes, Jeremiah echoes the words of Moses. Jeremiah 31, 31 and 33, yeah. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. For this is the covenant that, will make, that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. Yeah. Ezekiel yeah. 36, 26 to 27. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. And how about with Moses? Remember when the spirit was being poured out on the elders and Joshua said, hey, these guys who refuse to come, they're they're prophesying too. Stop them. No, I wish that all of Israel were prophets and that God would put his spirit in all of them. Like that was the yearning of the new covenant. That was the yearning of better things yet to come where it wasn't just a few, but that God would pour out his spirit 
upon all flesh. I think Joel is actually picking up on those words when he says, God will pour out his spirit on all flesh, mm. men and women, slaves and free, right? Yeah. That comes directly from Moses saying, would that all God's people were, were, were had the Holy Spirit. Yeah, That yeah. all of God's people were prophets, that you would write <sighs> your law within them. And so what I would argue in Stephen's sermon is that what Stephen is showing is that any accusation that we've rejected Moses yeah. is false because as right. followers of Jesus, we are basically saying that we are in fact disciples of Moses. We believe in Jesus because we followed Moses. And, and what mm. I find at the end of Stephen's sermon, just a couple more thoughts as we conclude, I want you to notice that Stephen finishes his sermon walking the path of Moses and the prophets, not against them, but with them. Verses 54 through 60. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped up their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. What I, what I find to be Stephen, Stephen follows in this legacy of rejection. Right. To be called to the people of Israel, to be called to this world, regardless yeah. of Jews, right. Arabs, Gentiles. Yeah. We are, we are following in the legacy of the prophets. We're following in the legacy of Moses. Who made you ruler? Who made you? Who called you? Jeremiah, you know, he says to King Hezekiah, uh, King Zedekiah, that is, what wrong have I done to you or your servants or this people that you've put me in prison? Hebrews 13, 12 through 13. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp yeah. and bear the reproach he endured. We, 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 like Stephen, will live a legacy of rejection, but... Like Stephen, we also have to live a legacy of forgiveness. We saw Moses interceding. God, blot me out of your book if you don't bring this people up. Paul, Romans 9, 2 through 4. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from, from Christ for the sake of my brothers. Yeah. My kinsmen, according to the flesh, they are Israelites. And finally... Yeah. Stephen's prayer echoes the prayer of Jesus. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so how does our faith in Yeshua, or why does our faith in Yeshua fulfill the law? Well, Stephen shows us because we believe in the prophet whom Moses prom promised, and also because we believe in the new covenant, which Moses is very clear. Who pro he promised that we need that new covenant and we need that circumcision. Yeah. of the heart. Oh, thank you, Dr. Postel. And uh, Father, we just ask that you would circumcise our hearts, Lord, for those who are struggling with this, that maybe they've been living by their own merits and and faith and in, in, uh, in what they can do and how they can perform, that they would see the gospel. For our brothers and sisters who are outside of the faith, we just ask that they would come and that they would see the living word of life, that they would be filled with your spirit. We also just ask, Lord, in this time where there's many enemies at every side, uh, socially and religiously, politically, whatever the conflict is, that we would have that heart like Stephen to pray for them, to intercede for them, to ask for your forgiveness uh, for those who are even opposing you and are opposing us. I just ask that your Holy Spirit would fill us, that we would be able to be witnesses like our brother Stephen, and Lord, we pray this in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. Amen. If this touched your heart, will you help pay it forward so that others can hear the same message of life? Partner with our team to bring the gospel to Israel and the nations.